All right, so again, I'd like to say welcome everyone. Thank you for coming this evening. Uh, my name is Eva Ann Johnson. I'm a genealogy and local history librarian here at Wilmette Public Library. Uh, tonight we welcome Mike Carson, who is going to speak to us about online resources for G Jewish genealogy in Chicagoland. So a professional speaker, Mike Carson is a member of the Association of Professional Genealogists, or APG the Genealogical Speakers Guild, or GSG, and is past president of the Jewish Genealogical Society of Illinois. He has presented over 300 talks on genealogy topics locally, nationally, and internationally, including at the Newberry Library and Spertus Institute for Jewish Learning and Leadership in Chicago. Mike is the author of the Jewish Gen website, Guide to Jewish Genealogy in Chicagoland and has published articles on genealogy. Um, so I'm sure you'll have many questions for him and we'll have time at the end of the presentation to answer those. Please put all of your questions in the chat. And like I said, Michael answered those toward the end, unless it's a very brief clarification kind of thing. Um, but please leave those questions in the chat and we'll get to them. So thank you, Mike, so much for being here today and sharing your expertise. And I will turn it over to you. Well, hello. Um, welcome. It's uh, an honor to uh, be in Wilmette. I, I think I gave my last talk there about uh, 10 years ago on, on a similar topic. But I'm glad to see all of you. And some of you actually, uh, I suspect I know uh, based on uh, what I see. So what I'm going to do in a minute is uh, share my screen uh, to go through my PowerPoint. The interesting thing that uh, Eva Ann said uh, is that if you could look at the three little dots and then you can change your name. So we always get a question in Jewish genealogy is uh, when did my grandfather change his name? He came through Ellis Island and uh, he started as Pekarski when he went there, but they said that was too complicated. So he came out being Carson with a K differently. Of course, um, it wasn't that easy. That never happened. Uh, they may have changed their name a week later when they tried to get a job and they didn't want to be known as Pekarski because it sounded too, too ethnic, too immigrant-like, but uh, whatever. So it wasn't as easy as technology we have today, which just three little dots and we could just change our name <laughs> and go. Uh, so I'm going to try and share my screen now. This will take a second of uh, technology changeover. So be patient with us for one more second. And uh, hopefully, um, how does that look? Do we, uh, Eva, have we yep, successfully it looks good done to me. it? Okay, so what I'm gonna do today is, is cover a broad subject, online resources for Jewish genealogy in Chicagoland. When I started doing genealogy uh, over 20 years ago, you know, we were back in the microfilm reader era uh, of turning microfilms and mailing away for death certificates. What I estimate, and this isn't scientific, is what it took me five years to do when I started, I could do in approximately two hours today with the online resources available. So to me, it's a tremendous, you know, I can get a citizenship paper for someone in two hours and before God only knows how long uh, it would take to do that. You might even have to go out to uh, Utah, to Salt Lake City, to the Mormon Library to get some of these things. So it's really a big change. And what I'm going to do my handout is, uh, I think, six pages. So I've tried to put all the links in there and try and make it um, understandable uh, that you can find those links. You don't have to start writing down links here. And um, hopefully the links will be live in the handout. So uh, if you leave it on your computer, you can click on them and avoid you know, some potential error in that. So, that, so I'm gonna give you more of an appreciation of just the scope of things that are available online. So we're going to, I'm going to start with a little history. Uh, most of you have some idea about Ch Jews of Chicago. Uh, your family grew up there, but I'm just going to kind of run through a little bit to give you a little 
background. Again, I'm talking about a two minute view version, so that's fast. And I always start with something a little light. Of course, uh, you know, I found this and says, of course, this is all pending a thorough investigation into your family history. And I've added my own little parenthetical thing, if you can see my pointer here with our technology and a DNA sample. So now, um, God only knows what we can find out. And I'm not talking about DNA tonight, but it's almost uh, a huge part of, of genealogy, Jewish genealogy and all genealogy today. So the two minute view is that the earliest Jews arrived in, in Chicago in the 1830s. And you know this was the far, the wilderness out west. Um, permanent settlers started around uh, 1841. They came from Germany, around Munich, from Bavaria. They started as peddlers and later they were dry goods, clothing, grocery stores. And they really were the beginning of, of, of the reform movement. That's what they brought, reform Judaism. Temple Sinai in the city, Congregation Sinai was kind of the uh, pivotal point of all that. Um, and they were so reform that they used to have, you know, Shabbat services on Sunday morning. So that was kind of uh, a view of what, of what they did. Um, here it is down at the federal building. And if you're fast enough, after 9-11 and you go and you want to take some photos of the federal building. If you do it real fast, then the guy comes over to me and says, oh, you can't take any pictures down here. It's illegal. I said, okay, I won't. So I got this. So this is the place down in the federal building downtown on Jackson where the first uh, KAM temple was established in 1847. So the Jews have been here, not in great numbers back then, but mostly from Germany, uh, then. The big group of Jews, of course, came from Eastern Europe in the second wave starting around 1881. Uh, the Tsar was assassinated and uh, that gave the Jews another reason to leave. So I have my little pointer here. So up here is Lithuania and Latvia. Down here is Belarus, Minsk and Mogilev. Over here is Poland, Warsaw, uh, Lublin, and then down here is uh, Ukraine. Kiev is the biggest place in Ukraine and, and goes down here. And then down here outside of the pale is Romania. And uh, down here is the Red Sea and Odessa. So this is the area where most of the Jews came from. The biggest today, 80%, over 80% of the American Jews came from Eastern Europe. Uh, they're Ashkenazi in origin and they, uh, came from this area. So that's uh, what they came from. In, in doing Jewish genealogy, it's most important to know, gee, my family came from Minsk. Uh, not so much the country. The, the famous joke is that when I grew up, we lived in four different countries, but we never moved from the same house. So these things changed over time. This was Russia, it was white Russia, now it's Belarus. So it changed. And, and of course, Poland changed and all those changed, but you've got to focus down on the town and the Gabernia, uh, like Minsk, which is maybe the size of the, Illinois. You think of these like the size of states. So that didn't change over time, but of course the name of the country changed. So you can uh, see in the census, sometimes they'll have different, 10 years later, they'll say they're from a different place, but they really weren't. It's just the place changed, the name place. Okay, again, Eastern European Jews started coming in, in the uh, 1880s. They settled mostly in the Maxwell Street area, just south of the Loop. They kind of created a shtetl with small, over 100 synagogues in storefronts, independent little synagogues. Of course, they were mostly Orthodox and they were all very poor. They had uh, beards and hats and black dress, kind of like what the Orthodox looked like today when you see them uh, in the area. And again, they kind of recreated this shtetl. And of course, Maxwell Street is known for the market that they created, uh, which went, was very strong for many, many years uh, before it got modernized. So here's, the, here's a, a city map of Chicago. And they started here, Maxwell Street area, just south of the loop. And then as they got more money and successful, they moved to uh, what is Lawndale today, which is a very rough, depressed area. Um, and they lived there for many years. 
they also lived in all these other areas and uh, most today live in the north suburbs uh, where we are in Wilmette, uh, Cook County, North Cook County and Lake County. Uh, most of the Jews in the city today live up here in Rogers Park and West Rogers Park where there's a strong uh, Orthodox community. Okay, the Jewish population started around uh, 1900, 75,000 and grew to about 300,000 which where it is today. So it's been pretty stable. And this is the really metropolitan area of, of whatever, um, concentrated in the North and Northwest suburbs today. And of course we had the second wave of Russian immigrants uh, coming uh, in the 1990s, 2000 and the uh, Jewish population is about 3 million. So we're about 3% uh, somewhere in there. Of course, if you go to the metro area, it's much larger. Okay, so what I'm gonna do today is focus on doing research from anywhere. And that's kind of today, uh, of course, we've had a terrible year where most of us have been home a lot, okay? And we weren't able to go out, but the internet is just growing, you know, every day so much faster that, you know, I can't even keep up with it. So that's kind of my biggest frustration is I try and do these talks and try and keep up to date with what's going on. And it's a, it's a challenge. Um, we still may have to occasionally mail things, but mostly everything you can get online uh, one way or another. And we have so many services today that it's uh, again, hard to keep up with all that. So all I'm gonna go through is the various types of records um, kind of where are the best sources, ideas, again, most of the links, and I've tried to outline it in, in my handout, if you're looking for death records, marriage records, or birth records. So I'm going to start with this, and then I'm going to go through each of these sections. Um, I'm kind of telling you what I'm going to do, and then I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you that I told you. So if you can understand that, you'll be able to understand the rest of my talk. Okay, so in Chicago, we're very lucky in a way, okay, and I'm gonna talk a little more about it, is uh, we have a few very large cemeteries. I'm gonna go through all these things in detail. So let me just go to that rather than talk through the outline. Okay, so I say um, roughly we have four cemeteries that have over half of the Jewish burials and um, which makes it of course easier to find somebody rather than if we hit a lot more. Of course, there's a lot of small cemeteries and you don't know that, but if you started with just these four and kind of looked for your ancestors, depending on what, what their ethnicity was and when they died, uh, you can kind of get it down. Waldheim in Forest Park is the largest. It has uh, approximately 162,000 burials going back to the 1860s. And they have uh, two other sections, which are kind of, um, nearby Free Sons and Menorah Gardens. So that's a huge thing and they have a good service. If you call them and you're looking for somebody, uh, they can tell you, they don't have an online index, but if you call them, they, they will look for someone. West Lawn is the next one up in, uh, off of Montrose Avenue in Harlem. And they have over 48,000 burials starting in 1937. So they're kind of a newer synagogue, a uh, new cemetery. Um, and then there's Silverman and Weiss has uh, over 26,000 and they're really adjacent to Waldheim. At some places you can't tell where you're at, which cemetery you're in because these sections kind of were intermersed, but they're also very back in, in the same era uh, as Waldheim. And they, the next one here is Zion Gardens, which is uh, off of Addison and Narragansett and they have over 25,000 burials and they go back to the oldest ones. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And that now also is managed by Waldheim. So again, if you're looking for somebody and you don't have any other clues, if you started with these four phone calls, you might be able to find them. Now, when you go into historic and I'm, I'm always looking for the oldest relatives and where they are uh, so we can go back in time, um, Zion Gardens actually has the oldest burials. They go back to the mid 1800s. In fact, the first Jewish cemetery was located at Lincoln Park. 
And some of these graves actually have been moved twice and now they're in the Mount Myru section. So they're very old. If you go there, um, you'll see really some, some old uh, washed out headstones. Some of them are unreadable, but that's where the oldest burials were uh, when they started, you know, back. They thought Lincoln Park actually was out of the city when they started that, that was in the suburbs. Hebrew Benevolent Society and Jewish Graceland are kind of adjacent uh, on Clark Street near the big Graceland Cemetery, but not to be confused with that. It's not a section of that cemetery. It's a separate uh, little cemetery with about two sections with about uh, under 4,000 burials from, from there. And they go back to the 1850s and um, they were mostly German Jews, uh, Reformed Judaism, people who, who, who were buried there. There's some Civil War burials there. So that's mainly um, who's there. So if you said you had German Jews going way back, I would tell you to start at these two places. Rose Hill uh, is off of Peterson uh, Avenue by the railroad tracks there, by the uh, L in the city, and they go back quite a way. This isn't exclusively a Jewish cemetery. It has um, all kinds of ones. Not, Jews are a small percentage there. Uh, Waldheim again, and Silverman and Weiss, Free Sons, they go back to the 1860s. And then Oakwoods on, on the south side has over 3,000 burials, and they go back to the 1870s. So all these cemeteries, um, are visit, you can visit them. Uh, you can, some of them, I'll, I'll talk about what online records are re available in each one of those. Okay, so this is Waldheim. And a member from my genealogy site was out there and she said, oh, I had this picture, there was a deer there. So it's in uh, Forest Park. There's over 300 sections. And what this cemetery now became uh, one cemetery, but it was really owned by over 300 different organizations uh, they were the Shoals or the Wandsmanshaften I'm talking about here, which were immigrant organizations from the town, from Dvinsk, from Kishinev, who bought cemeteries via their organization um, to help people. Uh, sometimes they gave them the graves, but sometimes they just made it easier and got a better deal from the cemetery. And that way they were buried uh, together. It's... Um, it was way west. People had to take the L trains, which are close by, and they had buried uh, cemetery processionals where they put the um, tombstone, the uh, casket on, on the L, and they went west. And so that's it. And there's also various groups, Knights of Joseph. So if you find somebody there, you need to find out what section they are and then find out what it means if they're a member of the Knights of Joseph or some other organization, some town. Vinsker section, what'd that mean? That mean they were from there? Maybe, maybe not, but it gives you some clues as, as we're Jewish detectives. Um, cemetery online records. So here is, you know, the thing is exploding. I'm gonna talk through each of these things, but there's, this is a thing uh, that again is exploding. Uh, some of our, my genealogy society, which I'll be plugging from now, and then uh, jgsi.org uh, has quite a few online things, but I'm gonna kind of walk through each one of these. Uh, Jewish Data is a commercial site. And uh, what these folks did, they went out to the cemeteries and just took pictures. Um, they didn't ask for permission. They just went out there and then they put them online uh, by their name. And uh, my count, last count was they have over 135,000 headstone images from Chicago area cemeteries. So especially Waldheim and Silverman and Weiss, they have 105,000 to 24. See, I have an exact number um, from that area. They won't tell you what section they're in exactly, but you get a full image of, of the uh, headstone, which is very valuable. Uh, if you know a little Hebrew and they put their father's name, picture, other things. Rosemont Park, Rose Hill, um, sometimes we don't know exactly how many of these are Jewish. Memorial Park also isn't all Jewish. So um, New Light is Jewish and West Lawn, of course, is Jewish. So they have, um, and then they also have cemeteries outside of Chicagoland. 
I found uh, they have the, the organization out of New York State. So they have a lot of New York images. I found my relatives from Montreal on this. So um, if you have other research, um, whatever, and there's a little plug, if you join our genealogy society, you get access to this as part of your membership. Slight plug. Okay, so how does it work? I'll give you a little run through on this. This is my grandmother, Bertha Frost. And I'm just searching, I click here on the search bar. And then it comes up, it's a key little thing here. There's a little camera, which says, aha, there's an image of her. Her death date was 1960 and she's in Chicago at Waldheim. So that's good uh, thing. And then I do two more clicks and I have her full headstone. And um, if you could read a little Yiddish, she's Brana Bat Kuna was her father's name. So it's always good for detective things. Is this my right person, um, you know, in detective work? And of course the image there gives her her death date, not exactly her birth date. You know, they're all varied, but at these old Jewish cemeteries, they pretty much give the Hebrew name, which of course is valuable to us genealogists to go back a generation and also figure out if Bertha's brother is there, you know, he has the same father's name. So that way you can kind of check that out. So um, our Jewish Genealogy Society uh, database has a link there. And this is, this, is, this is free to the public. We would like you to join, but um, we have today over 100,000 records. Uh, they're mostly cemeteries, memorial plaques, obituaries. And I'm gonna go through a little bit of this. Um, we have 24, 29 cemetery sections and uh, including over 46,000 from uh, West Lawn Cemetery. So if you just search our whole database, I'm searching the, just for Carson, I'm lucky. You know, there aren't too many Carsons. If you search Cone, um, it would be a little, get a few more results. I don't put any first name in there. And then I get basically my family records uh, some obituaries there uh, for my late wife and my father. Um, and then we get all the graves at West Lawn for my family. So this is just a simple example that can fit on there. But if you put the name in, then you'll find it from whatever resource we have in there. If there are Carsons and other things, they would come up. So, you know, I'm quite proud of this, but, uh, and you could search further if you wanted. The Jewish uh, Gen online burial record worldwide, they have over 3 million records. In Illinois, they have 28 different cemeteries and 54,000 burials. So again, uh, they have some things that we have. Sometimes you'll get duplications, but you're just looking. If you can find your person, it's great. If you can't, you can't. So um, whatever. Then there's this find a grave, which is an amazing resource. Uh, when I took the stamp of this, it was 121 million uh, grave records. I'm sure it's way more than that today. But again, you can search and, and filter it down and get full images. Sometimes they just have, um, they don't actually have an image of the grave, but they have some information about it. And this is done by volunteers who just go out for some reason and take pictures with their phone and there's an app and they upload it and it gives the GPS location. But if you find somebody that says that Mike Carson uploaded this thing, it doesn't mean that I'm your relative. It's just a kind of a person who did a good deed and whatever, and they probably don't know any more about that person than you do. You, you might find that they do, uh, but usually it's just someone doing a, a random act of kindness in, in their own way and posting those things. And, and uh, these are kind of some of the cemeteries. Again, I went through there and tried to click on them and see how many images. Again, um, the idea of this is just to show you that, hey, you might find somebody there and you might find their image. You might figure out what cemetery they're in because it has a, but you know, just because they're not there doesn't mean, oh, because they have Oakwood Cemetery that they're not in Oakwoods. This is just, it's not an exact science that 
exact control. And even, even sometimes if you call all the time and they say they can't find the person, it doesn't mean that they're not there. It means that the name you have or something else might be wrong in there. There's a typo, whatever. So don't ever get conclusive evidence that if you can't find a record, that they're not there. I mean, they're probably not if you call the cemetery, but depending on what the name is and what they were buried under, you never know. Okay, the last one I'm talking about is billion graves, which sounds a lot. Okay, again, uh, they find a grave is free. Billion graves is kind of free. Now that they have some associations, but again, if I did cones here, I found them in memory gardens. You know, they have Waldenheim, which isn't exactly. So to summarize, there's a lot of online uh, information here. Today, the uh, Jewish data, our Jewish genealogy site, find a grave, Joe Barr. So, you know, as, again, some of these are going Hi, Mike. I don't know if you can hear me, but your screen was frozen. Oh, and we just lost him. Hi, everybody. I guess his uh, internet was having some issues, so we'll get connected again in just a second. Thanks for hanging in there with us. Hi, Mike. Welcome back. I think you're muted. We got yeah. disconnected. Okay. Um, am, is my image up there now on the funeral? Yes. Home? Okay. Yes. All right. So is this, this you think, where you lost or I should go back one more? Oh, wait. No, we can't see your, your um, screen. We'll need to do screen share again. Okay. Okay. One second here. Um, okay. One second. To do screen share. Okay, is it back now? And I think one. it was one slide before this. Okay. Okay. So this was my summary. Uh, okay, sorry for that. Okay. You think that's right? Maybe a little bit earlier. Okay, that one? Yeah. Okay. It froze when you were wrapping up the slide, I believe. Okay. Okay. So you know what I was saying is um there's a lot out there and you just have to try all these things. Be persistent. If you're a good genealogist, you'll be persistent. Okay, the summary of uh, Jewish graves, if you add all these up, uh, you get to close, close to 300,000. Some of them are duplicated, but there's a lot online. So uh, before you start calling all the cemeteries, I would do five, five clicks on these websites and try and see what you could find and see if you can get the actual image uh, rather than going out there especially if you're far away. Okay, so um, the, the funeral homes are kind of a sad situation. They've suffered from uh, being corporatized, consolidated, um, and these are all the old cemeteries, Weinstein's brother, Palmer Lauer. So if you have an old death certificate, those all got consolidated into Weinstein's. These funeral homes all got consolidated into Pizer's. Firth was another one. And then Weinstein's and Pizer's are now consolidated under one corporate thing. So you can call them uh, if you get lucky, 
they might be able to give you some information. They'll probably tell you, oh, there's no records or they're stored off site. Uh, so that's not a very good resource today, unfortunately. Okay, so death certificates. Um, Illinois State has two basically death indexes on their website, one for pre-1916 and one for after 1916. So death certificates weren't necessarily required uh, back always in time. So that's why the difference is. If you know about Steve Morris's search engines, he uh, has some advanced Soundex technology that he uses to make this, these searches a little easier. Uh, again, there's no, no charge for any of that, um, but they'll tell you and then you could have to order it. Um, Cook County Vitals is kind of closed now. I'm gonna talk about that later. Um, the, the, they used to have an index in order that we expect them to open up again, but some, for some reason they shut down during COVID. Family Search, the Mormons have a lot of death certificates and extra, extracts. I didn't mention Ancestry. Uh, I have a friend in Springfield that if you email Molly, she can go to the state archives and for about $5, either email you or mail you a death certificate in a, in a relatively short time. Now, this is what I was talking about, Cook County. Uh, they redesigned the website. They actually did some nice things, but then they shut down when COVID broke for some reason, and they haven't reopened their website. So that's uh, not too good. They, at one time, were actually allowed you to, to get a download a, a, a document, then they, stop that and now they don't have anything. So hopefully I could just use the index sometimes to see if I could find somebody, even if I didn't want to get it. So that will open up sometime, but it hasn't yet. Uh, obituaries, today we're down to about two newspapers, uh, the Tribune and the Sun-Times. So the Tribunes are online. I'll talk about that a little more, basically through your local library like Met. If you go on there, you can search from home. Uh, the whole newspaper going back to 1849 by name. Um, you have to have a few techniques, when to use quotes, when not to, but your local librarian will be able to help you, right? <laughs> Historical Jews uh, put notices more into the daily news in the sun uh, historically because uh, the Tribune wasn't politically their paper, it was expensive, it was more exclusive. So the average uh, Jewish person preferred to put their death notices in these papers, though they are not online yet. Um, they're in microfilm and you have to go somewhere when the world is open to like the uh, Chicago History Museum uh, or Chicago Public Library downtown. And actually the um, Arlington Heights Library also has some. Obituaries are a great thing, and our genealogy society has about 25 years of obituaries, full text, online, available, searchable, uh, which we're very proud of. And then also, I'll show you how to search the Chicago Sentinel, uh, which has, you can search their full text of their magazines, their newspapers, and you can find sometimes obituaries in there. Uh, this is how, kind of how you do ProQuest via the library, um, search on obituaries, put Frost in there and see what you find. I'm not, I don't have time tonight to, to go through everything, but um, if you know how to do these things, it's very good and you can be able to do that from home. Uh, the Chicago Tribune has a kind of a beta site, which also has some Chicago Tribune. It's still not quite full. It has mostly later dates of, of stuff when things were beginning to get more digitized. But again, um, if you don't want to buy some expensive uh, newspapers.com or something, it's a good place to start. Um, and the JUNF News I was talking about, I'm going to give you a little example, run through that a little bit, but we have, uh, well, we have more than 17,000 records. So I was looking up uh, one of our members from our society who passed away, um, Seidenberg, and see, I just put surname in. This is all based on the Steve Morris 
technology of searching. So if you've ever searched Ellis Island, you should be able to catch on. Otherwise, um, it's fairly intuitive, but sometimes you need help. So I just put the last name in exactly. Um, if it was Cone or Pekarski, I might use one of these other options, but this one's an exact. And I know you can't read this, but it gives me all the Seidenbergs who are in our database. Um, some have obituaries, some are at Tick Tin Cemetery, West Lawn Cemetery, various things. So if you're searching for a family, we have various records on them. Um, so that's a good source. Uh, the Sentinel is the newspaper that was published for Jews from 1911 through 1996 is online, fully text searchable. So um, there's over 2000 issues. So this is very good if you're looking for what clubs your parents were in, your grandparents about the shul, you put the Romanian shul in, what was going on. And um, so this has been digitized. There's a couple sites. I have the links on, on your handout, um, one in Israel, and one in the state of Illinois, basically the same thing, uh, but the search engines work slightly differently. So if you're not comfortable with one, you can try the other. But then again, this is very good on Jewish history. And if you can't find things out about marriages, deaths, other events that they put in the newspaper, here's an example back to 1931, uh, obituary of Morris Barnett. And of course it gives you um, his, his children's names, and uh, steps on a, a Fanny Burnett, his, his sibling. So uh, that is a little clip and he just searched on Morris Barnett and found that information. So that was uh, good. Okay, marriages. Uh, we don't have in the Jewish community what the Christians have, where you have all these church records and they documented it and they stored it well. Uh, every synagogue did their own thing, and uh, Sinai congregation, they did collect, uh, somebody digitized their records from 1861 to 1905, that's on Jewish Gen. There is a statewide marriage index, but it's all way back in the time that uh, most of our ancestors weren't here. Um, Ancestry.com has marriage indices, uh, again, Cook County vitals, but, you know, those aren't available right now. And again, the Sentinel has marriage records, but marriages um, are a little tough. I would use Ancestry basically to, to try and find them. Birth records, uh, again, Cook County is closed today now um, and you need to order the certificate. Family search, the Mormons have a lot of birth records. You're not gonna find too many original documents online. You find mostly indices, but that's that's always a good start. I don't I haven't seen too many real the birth documents. Um, they might have some at the uh, Wilmette Library there, uh, not the Wilmette, the Wilmette Mormon Church, um, not too far from you, and of course Ancestry. Okay, now that was vital records. Whew. Okay, so now let's uh, keep going uh, and location residence records. Chicago renumbered their streets in 1909 to get a more uniform system. So my mother's birth certificate from 1907 said she was born at 521 South Halstead, but that now is really 1314 South Halstead. Uh, and the Chicago History Museum and their website have some aids in translating that. So that made quite a difference. And this is really in the heart of the Maxwell Street area. It's basically Halstead and Maxwell. Uh, which was right in the middle of it. Um, there's a lot of aids that I can't go through all these on census and interpreting things, but the census of course is, is one of the key things you should use. There's nothing specifically Jewish about it, um, but uh, you sh that's a key thing of tracing where your family lived and making sure that you, once you have a few members of the family, of course the census becomes a great uh, resource. And the uh, 1890 census was destroyed. So there is Chicago voter registrations on Ancestry to give you some information from 1888 to 1892. So that's uh, valuable. City directories, again, are a great 
great thing in Chicago published them from 1839 to about 18, 1928 and 29. Uh, they have a lot of good information. If you're looking for families where they worked, whether the brothers both worked for the same company, uh, they live together. So there's a lot of clues once you get going uh, on there. Uh, Newberry Library has a lot of aids in this, this thing, finding your ancestors. And um, probably the best source actually for city directories is a service called Fold3, which is now part of Ancestry. And they have most of them back, uh, going back in time. So again, once you get deep into it and you wanna try and figure out, are these brothers related? Were they living together? Did they work for the same company? Uh, you can dig in a lot there. Property records. So if you, this is Cook County. And uh, if someone lived 2940 Chase in Chicago, it's in that Northwest section of West Rogers Park is where I grew up. So I put 2940 Chase in the search in Chicago. I had to fill this in so that I wasn't a robot and I clicked the search button. And then I get an image of the place uh, from 2008, um, address, square footage, and um, the age, one full bath. We had luxury for uh, the six people that lived there. We had one, one bathroom. So that was pretty good. Uh, but if your family lived in some place now that's, um, in a neighborhood you don't want to go, and, and Lawndale say, okay, you're not going there too fast, you can go and see what that place looks like today. It might be an empty lot, but some of those old stone duplexes, two flats are still there. Um, they've withstand this, the search of time. So if you would say, okay, I know where my father lived when he was in high school in Lawndale, you could use this, again, it's open to the public. This is public information. Uh, I'm up to naturalization, going a little fast, but it's just a lot to, to cover. We're lucky in Chicago, in our area, that back in the 1930s, the Works Progress Association, WPA, had a project to microfilm all the, and create an index of naturalization petitions for all of Northern Illinois, some Wisconsin, some Indiana. So these things are now available. Most of them are online on either Ancestry or Family Search. So that was uh, terrific so that you could find a snapshot of, of the information about them and then go deeper. It tells what court they were in when they were naturalized. Um, actually, some of the federal U.S. District Court naturalizations are online today. That's, that's what I was saying before. And some of the local courts you have to go to the Daily Center uh, in Chicago. The clerk of the Circuit Court um, has online searchable, I'll show you this later, uh, more than 500,000 naturalization petitions, the first papers of naturalization. So those again are very valuable. Um, going down to legal and moving along, Ancestry has put some wills online whatever. So I was searching Nathan Cohn, Chicago. His birth was about 1850. And I found his will, his whole will, uh, the text of it, you have to navigate a little bit. Um, it's not quite as easy as you'd like. But this, again, these, these records are public domain. There's nothing private about a will. You can always get it if you knew what court they were at and where to go. But again, uh, there's divorce records. There's a lot of things um, online today that if you just go looking, roaming, uh, you can find it. So this is a, a tremendous uh, resource. Okay, now the, the, the circuit court has added a lot more records. Um, they don't always have the full record, but they have, um, here's civil domestic relations, again, probates and wills, traffic records, naturalization and mortgage foreclosures. So you can search in any of those little boxes there for people in various uh, things via the uh, clerk's office. This is the naturalization, which I was gonna talk about. So this is Max Blumenfeld or Blumenfield, um, his birth date, 
He was born in, in Botasani, they say Romania. Um, and this is the detail of his first papers that he filed, uh, where he was from, his birth date, his address, um, and when he arrived. So that's a tremendous resource. He, he took a ship out of Hamburg and arrived uh, November 23rd, 1901. And he declared his for citizenship uh, beyond that. So that's a good place to start. And you can actually order the, order the records from them today. I just did some uh, by, by phone, by sending them $3. So it was pretty expensive, but I got it in about two weeks. Okay, life in, in Jewish Chicago, this is the last section. And um, doing a lot of work on this now in the future, but trying to get more meat on the bones. I'm going to give you examples of three three types of, of, of documents. First, there's what we call the Chicago Jewish Community Blue Book. Um, it's a directory of organizations or officers and membership from 1918. So those of you who want to go back and find your grandparents, great-grandparents, um, this is a great thing. It was digitized via the Newberry Library, and it's up on a... Uh, service called the Internet Archive. And it's the full text of that book, fully searchable. This is what the cover looked like from 1918. And I was just testing it. So I, um, our genealogy say meets in Bethel. There's a couple of Bethels, of course, here in the north suburbs. But there, after the search, I found um, information about uh, Bethel. I clicked on that and then I found information there on the history of it, a picture of the old, where it was and where, what there was going on there on the eve of the great Chicago fire, who the Rabbi Rappaport is. I don't know if you can read all this, but so there's a lot of research you can do on what was going on. You could search for the people here, Reverend David Gottlieb, uh, Simon Klee. So if, if your family lived back then and they're involved in things, you might be able to find them by searching this. Again, the Sentinel, um, talking about this again and again, because it's a great resource. Um, again, over 2000 issues and um, fully text searchable. So that you have to have a little technique in it sometimes so you don't get too much. If you just put cone in, whatever, you're gonna have trouble. So. But you had to play with it, but there's a lot in there. Everything that was written on a weekly basis about the Jews in Chicago is in here. Um, I found this thing about my father. He was the treasurer of the AID club, whatever. He never told me that, of course, um, whatever. So meetings of sisterhoods that they're involved in, Hadassah, um, your grandmother, your mother, whoever that might be you might find some articles about them in this. So it's very um, good for just kind of going beyond what we normally do in genealogy of just having births, marriages, and deaths, get a little more insight to what they did, if they had leadership in some organizations, what they were involved in. Uh, this talks about North Shore Congregation in Glencoe, uh, programs they had given by Fanny Fink. So. Uh, there's a lot more stuff, I'll call it the meat on the bones, that we, we can easily miss in genealogy because we go to cemeteries, the birth and the deaths, and there's more, more of that than there. Our Jewish Genealogy Society uh, has various resources where we've indexed. I'm going to go through these quickly, um, and that's our latest kick is to find documents. So if you have any documents, uh, books about uh, Jewish bondsmanship and organizations that you found and they're dusty on your shelf and you got from your grandmother, they were involved in these organizations, uh, we'd like to digitize them. But I'm gonna go through this. This is a Drexel home, uh, which is a, a senior home on the south side, Drexel and 62nd Street. Um, it opened in 1893 and what they had was a book we found down at Spurtis where they logged everyone who came in there uh, and wrote, uh, interviewed them 
their biographies. So we have over 700 biographies that entered the home for aged Jews. And here's an example of one, uh, Solomon Wolfsky, you know, um, and this is what they wrote down uh, when he applied, when he was approved for membership and he came, he was born in 1819 in Nisan, Russia, came to US 1880, seven children. Later they logged when he died. Uh, one of our members, Barry Wolf, you can see it's, he's no longer Wolfsky, uh, said the information he found here, he could find in no other source. You know, it wasn't in the family, it wasn't in ancestry, it was just uh, very unique. So again, these are uh, a lot of reformed Jews there were in this uh, organization, but you never know if you search our whole database, if, uh, if you search Solomon, Wolfsky or just Wolfsky, you might find it. This is the first Romanian congregation, again in Lawndale. This is where my, my grandparents belonged. And this is actually a, a recent picture from two years ago. We went out there, uh, another member of my society, and they still maintain, you see the Jewish star there? They still, this looks like an ark. Uh, they don't have any Torahs in there, but they have some, you know, Outside, the, there's a Jewish star up on the, so it's it's kind of amazing. What we were looking for, they said, oh, we have, they have some plaques, someone gave us a tip. So we went there. Well, they, we also have their book, uh, their anniversary book from 1929. And again, we digitized here, Samuel Brill, uh, again, a biography. He came to Chicago in 1897. So this is valuable information. This is Wendy, a member of our society. And we're trying to make some sense out of these old plaques uh, that were they took down, and, and they they're very unique. They they had just the name and the donation, like a hundred dollars, fifty dollars. It didn't say who made the donation, whatever. So we're still kind of figuring out uh, what to do with these a little bit, but uh, they're quite interesting. There was a book of Chicago, the book of Chicagoans, which was like who's who in Chicago and um, written in three editions, 1911, 1905, 1917. We went through there and we tried to extract the people that were Jewish. So this is all online and we kind of searched, it was searchable. So we searched, uh, Ron Miller and I, another member of my society, we searched for things that would maybe identify the people as being Jewish, like, okay, Temple Sinai, Ravisol Country Club was a very Jewish country club on the South Side. So if they belong to that or the Standard Club or anything that said Jewish in, it, uh, in their bio. And we came out with 196 people out of, out of 700 pages. Here's an example, Milton Florsheim. I'm sure most of you have heard of Florsheim Shoes. Um, and this is about Milton. His little biography again, it's a different slant. And he was, you know, members of Standard Club, Ravis Law. He liked playing golf, you know, and he lived on, on the south side on Grand Boulevard and his office was downtown. So I, again, we're trying to find more meat, different information about people rather than just, you know, uh, what they did. Again, we're trying to put meat on the bone and these things, we're working a lot in this area. So if you have any, any other things that I have more depth on, I'd like to hear. Um, databases, again, I'm summarizing here. Our Jewish Genealogy Society, Jewish data. We're, we have a new project um, that I'm calling JCRP, which is gonna be on the history of the Jews of Chicago, references to all the history books. So if you have any questions about uh, anything uh, of Rhines or anything from Jewish history that you're stumped on, what this means, what this organization was, um, send it to me because we're still kind of testing this out uh, on a few people and we're seeing whether it works. Uh, our videos from our genealogy society, from all of our 90 programs are online accessible for members and we have a big help desk. So this is kind of the sales pitch. Uh, if you go to jgsi.org, you can join for as little as $25. So this is, um, we do help people. We have a website and phone and the other major organization in, in Chicago is the Jewish Historical Society. Uh, 
Chicago Jewish Historical Society, and they they have a lot of meetings on the history of the Jews in Chicago, and quite a quite a good organization and a great website. So that's where I'm going to end. I think I'm just just before eight o'clock, so I may still be okay. And um, even Anne, I don't know if anything's come in or people want to ask questions now. I. Um, yeah, we did have a few questions that came in. I don't know if you can see them in the chat or if you'd like me to read them. Why don't you read them? I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. That will give me a little more option. But why don't you read them? Um, that would help me a lot. Um, so there was one comment right at the beginning um, about something you had mentioned right at the beginning. Uh, and she says, Sai and I had weekday services on Sundays, not Shabbat services. So that was just a comment or a clarification yeah. about something. Okay. Um, and then someone else asked also at the beginning when you were talking about uh, the general history of, of Jews in Chicago, um, she asked, where did the original Jewish Bavarian settlers live? Uh, you know, I'm not... Uh, I think they lived on the south side, uh, pretty much in, in Hyde Park and in, in those areas. Um, but I, you know, I, I trace mostly the, the Eastern European. But they lived a lot of their institutions were on the south side, um, so I think that's where they lived. Okay, and there was someone else when you were talking about. Um, Waldheim Cemetery and some of the other cemeteries uh, had a cemetery question specific to Waldheim. So uh, she says, I remember an article about Waldheim in the Chicago Tribune in the early 1980s. A five-year-old boy was visiting the cemetery with his parents and in a freak accident, he was killed when a heavy headstone collapsed on his head. And apparently the graves had become so neglected that many were a danger. So why did funding and management become so diminished at Waldheim? And what is the current condition of the cemetery? Uh, well, that was true. Myrna's trying to raise her hand, so she might answer, help, help me. But uh, yeah, at one time, the cemetery was in very uh, bad shape. It was consolidated and taken over by the current Waldheim management company. And they've fixed up a lot of those. If you go out there, some of the graves are are still leaning, but I don't think they have any accidents. But part of their funding problem is that most of the people died there, you know, 100 years ago, 75 years ago, and their children are still not alive. So it's difficult for them to get funding for maintenance. So that's a constant challenge. I'll kind of defend them a little bit, but right now it's very safe. Uh, the headstones are not falling over, but at one time they did, some of them are leaning. And if you have your grandfather out there, they might have a note on it to try and get it to turn right side up, but it's not falling. If it's falling, they'll take it down uh, themselves. So that part is safe, but those those things did happen in the past. Yeah, and I think Myrna wanted to say something. You should be able to unmute You're if you muted, wanted Myrna. to. Yes, go. at the time when this tragedy happened, the state of Illinois uh, said that they would pay for half of the uh, cost of fixing up these stones and mm -hmm. and to and encouraging people to get perpetual care. And I, I fortunately took advantage of that. And because my mother and my brother used to go out every year to fix up the family graves. And I said, they're not gonna last forever doing that. So, all my immediate relatives are, all have um, endowed care and the state paid for half of it, but they're not doing it anymore. Thank you. And someone else had asked about uh, records pre-Chicago fire. So she said her family goes back to 1840 and she's been looking for marriage records prior to 1870 and maybe birth in 1870. So do you have any recommendations for pre-fire records? No, a lot of the records were destroyed and, and it wasn't, there was no laws back then, not till I think 1916, when you really had to have birth certificates and all these records. So um, 
there's no easy easy answer there. And maybe the newspapers or some of the other uh, publications that we have might have some something in them, but um, it, there's no easy easy answer for those. Just try and maybe look at the census. The census is the best thing if you want to, you, to at least find out who was alive in 1850 and how old they were and how many people were in the family. Uh, the census go back to, of course, to 1790. And those are, are, are pretty well preserved and um, mostly accurate, except for some people lied about their ages, but we won't. Right, that's okay. Mm -hmm. And this year is the 150th anniversary of the Great Chicago Fire. So I know this fall there's going to be a lot of uh, talks and presentations and those kinds of things about the fire because it's a big anniversary. So um, you might also catch a presentation that talks about pre-fire records or about the fire as well. Um, and someone else asked, are there any resources from the Covenant Club? You know, I, I really don't know. Um, it's a good question. Uh, I'll put that down and try and find out. But, I, you know, I just don't know. They're, they're closed now. Um, and whether they donated their records anywhere. Uh, unfortunately, we had a big resource at, at Spurtis uh, College for, for records like that. But uh, that's been closed for a number of years when they kind of fell on hard times from donors. So there's boxes and boxes of records uh, that are not being indexed and worked on. So that's kind of a, a tragedy we have right now. So we're trying to, and what we can do in our genealogy society, find some stuff. And we've gone in into Spurtis and, and digitize a couple of books they have, but they have a lot of boxes and boxes of things that are kind of buried there, unfortunately. All right, and another question, how do you go about finding someone when they're only listed in one census? So this kind of relates to what you were talking about, just the question before. Uh, we could not find a birth certificate or any kind of death record for that person. They're only in the one census. Do you have any suggestions for that? Well, this is, you know, a common, I have my detective hat here. I can put that on. Um, you have to see what names are and look for other people in the family. Now, if every if someone was in the 1850 census and they're four years old and they're not in the 1860 census and their whole family is there, uh, there's a good chance they died. OK, um, so I would maybe go to the cemetery and look for them there. Um, of course, sometimes their name changed. I have a grandfather that uh, in three different censuses, the one he was Jacob, one he was Jake. And the last, next one, he was Jack. And every 10 years, it was the same person, uh, but he called himself something else. You know, it was just a uh, person who came around and asked for census. They just gave a name. They didn't ask for your birth certificate or any documents. So he's Jack or he's Jake or he's Jacob. Uh, so sometimes that gets a little tricky or people spell the names wrong or they heard it wrong. Um, you know, when they wrote it down, they spoke with an accent and they didn't know Markovich or Markovitz. You know, they may have written it incorrectly or transcribed it. So there's a lot of things that go, go wrong and uh, maybe the city directories might be, but if it was a child or someone young, uh, you're not gonna find them in there. So if they wanna write to me uh, with a specific uh, question, then uh, Elisa Finley, I think is, uh, she was three, okay, and then she disappeared. So if she wants to send me an email about that, then um, at two in the morning when I don't have anything to do, I can kind of look, play with that and say, hey, this is what it was. So it was Elisa, um, you know, okay, thanks, Lisa. So, uh, you know, depending on what her name was. Mm -hmm. So that's all, I, I like to have questions to see whether, um, there's things I don't know. That's the best way I learn is by helping other people because my family, you know, came from Romania, so I know those things. But if you ask for a Poland question, then I don't quite know that. And and Phyllis was uh, had a comment also regarding being on 
just the one census, she found that sometimes they ended up going back to their country of origin and actually left the U.S. So they, so they went, went back, back on a house. trip and and were just happened to be gone during the census. Okay. Or maybe they stayed there. Right. The detective game. Yeah. Well, that's all the questions that were coming in. If anyone has any more questions, feel free to type them in the chat. I had a quick question. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your background? It looks like it's a map. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Oh, good. I think you were asking about my personal background. Oh, no, um, no, no. The, the background you're using on your screen. So over here, if you can read sideways, it says Douglas Park. So this is the Lawndale section. Um, somebody wrote a book and they put in all the Jewish institutions that were in that area. You know, this is number 30, uh, number 50. So somewhere I have an index of what all these Jewish shoals, um, schools, you know, institutions were that were in that area, 13th Street, 14th Street, Roosevelt Road, and that whole thing. So that's kind of my Jewish connection. So if you're looking for an institution or something about it, this new project I have, I'm really interested in, in helping people. So if you, if you have, you know, like, maybe my friends were, my family was members of the, the Wood Street Shoal, I got a question, okay? Well, there was no Wood Street Shoal per se, but by searching some of the online documents now, I found the shoal that was on Wood Street. You know, everyone called it the Wood Street Shoal, but it was really, you know, it had another uh, official name. So if you have one of those, detective things that your family lived there, they belonged to the shoal, they had a rabbi. I'm really interested in those to see whether uh, our newest project can deal with those to solve them or not. So that's my uh, challenge. And if anyone also has any documents, uh, you know, like I had that Romanian shoal anniversary document, if anyone has any documents from shoals that their family belonged to that they they got that's uh, on their bookshelf, they don't know what to do with, uh, let me know, because we were digitizing them and we're indexing them uh, and making it searchable. So it's it's quite a project for things that aren't gonna be on Ancestry. The Ancestry is going pretty fast. So I, I say that with a little trepidation. They'll probably come to us and say, oh, you got all this stuff. We'll give you a million dollars for it. I'll say, okay, you know, <laughs> so whatever. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Ancestry and those other sites are adding new stuff every day, so it's it's yeah. always worth checking back. Yeah. Um, I did want to mention that through the Wilmette Public Library, if you have a Wilmette Public Library card, we do have the Chicago Tribune Historical Archives. We have newspapers.com, um, Ancestry, Find My Past, um, all of those except Find My Past and Heritage Quest. All of those except Find My Past are available at home with your library card number. You go to our website, click on resources and online resources, and you can click on the links through there. Um, if you're in the library, you don't have to have a library card to, to access those. But if you're accessing it at home, you have to have a Wilmette library card. And if you don't have a Wilmette library card, check with your local library or maybe some other libraries nearby or maybe a you know family history center um, nearby that might have some of those kinds of things. Um, and yeah, and ancestry.com library edition is available remotely until the end of September. They have extended remote access to that. So if your local library has it, you should be able to access it remotely until at least the end of September. All right, were there any other questions? Anything else? Well, Mike, if they do have any other questions that they think of, you know, 10 minutes from now, um, are people able to contact you, email yeah. you? Yeah, I think the email is the best way. Okay. Uh, I don't want to get any calls at two in the morning when you wake up. No. And say, yeah. is. Where, what show was it that my grandmother went to? Ah, oh, you know, it was on 26th Street. Is that over here? Or 13th? Is this a shoulder? 
It was Independence Avenue. Maybe it's number 46 or 45, you know, so. Yeah. Um, so those, th those things will come. Once you start this thing, then, you know, your brain starts flowing. Yes, and you've given us a lot, a lot of resources to look over, and I'm sure a lot of us will be looking up stuff tonight, late into the night, looking at all these websites. So thank you so much, Mike, for coming and, and sharing all this with us and sharing your expertise, and uh, thank you so much. And thank all right. you all for coming and, and listening today. Thank you for the questions. Appreciate it. Um, it's nice. The comments are very nice in the chat. It's kind of a nice, nice touch. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you for those of you who are smiling out there because it's a little hard sometimes giving these talks remotely when I don't have the interaction uh, that I have in person. So just seeing a few smiling faces on the top of my map are, are, is nice. Thank you. Yes. All right. Well, thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful night and, and thanks. Have a good one. Okay. Thank you.